And Amanda, oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) What were you to introduce Bill and Steve? (laughs) Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So once again, welcome everybody to our hemp production webinar. Thank you so much for taking your Friday evenings to come and chat with us. Um, I'd really love to introduce our two amazing speakers. Uh, Would you both want to maybe introduce yourself, Bill? I'll go in alphabetical first, not because I like one or the other better, but Bill, would you like to go first? Yeah. uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, My name is Bill Bampka. I'm part of the Rutgers hemp team with Steve Comar. And we were fortunate enough, we didn't, with the pandemic, we didn't know that we were going to get out there, but uh, we were actually given what they call a return to research. So we got our first crop in for Rutgers this year. And I'm uh, Steve Comar, the other part of the hemp team. Hey guys, uh, I'm Scott Morgan. I'm a farmer member of NOFA, New Jersey. Um, I have worked in a consultation role with a good friend of mine at a Pennsylvania farm uh, for two years now growing hemp, um, both focusing both on um, quality for smokable flour and CBD extraction. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to share your screen for your presentations? Yeah, let me, I can bring it up if we're ready to go. Sure thing. And I have uh, you three spotlit as well, but for whoever's sharing screen, I'll have that as a spotlight so everybody can see that. Okay. There we go. Well, let's see. Welcome, everybody. So uh, Steve and I are going to uh, kind of team this. <laughs> I was going to cover the first half. He's going to cover the second half. And I wanted to go over a lot of the issues that we've seen raised this year and maybe a little bit of background about what's going on with hemp in, uh, in New Jersey. Um, and you joined us on a really good day because there was some actually some breaking news today in the, uh, in the world of hemp. Um, let's see. Uh, if you haven't heard yet, the final rule was actually released today from the USDA. Um, it goes into effect, I believe, is it, Steve, was it in March that's supposed to be implemented? Um, so. There's several changes that are going to take effect, but one of the ones that I have here, which is really going to probably have an impact on those of us growing, is the red arrow there where I talk about timing of sample collection. Um, we now are going to extend it to 30 days before harvest. Um, and one of the challenges nationwide was the rules had said you had to have it sampled within 15 days of harvest. And there's a few issues with laboratories, and that's also addressed uh, where they're going to allow because uh, the number of DEA certified labs is lacking. They're going to continue with the uh, um, extending to let other laboratories uh, do some of the sampling. But go on to the USDA website. Uh, I don't want to steal any of Steve's thunder. He's going to talk about the regulations. But you can find out what's actually going to be implemented in March. Great. Okay, so there's Rutgers hemp crop, just to prove that we actually grow it. Um, <laughs> and Steve will, Steve will give you a little bit more detail of it. Uh, we actually grew eight varieties at the Rutgers Snyder farm. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit uh, how we actually grow it, but that's some of our hemp crop. Not too bad for our first year. But one of the things I'd like to point out is I think it's a really interesting crop from my point of view, being an agronomist. But I don't necessarily consider it a beginner's crop. There's a lot of nuances to growing this and a lot to know about growing uh, hemp. And this is actually uh, produced for floral production, which I'll get into the different production systems in a bit. Um, here you again, here's some more of the, the hemp uh, and Steve will talk about it, but we use straw actually for weed control. You can see the straw in between there. And that's one of the challenges we'll talk about. And I know Steve will talk about it a little bit. Um, there's a number of challenges with this crop, um, but I'll leave it there. I don't want to steal Steve's uh, thunder there. Um, these are all actually local pictures, believe it or not. And this is what's kind of driving a lot of the interest, at least locally for us. Um, the picture on the right there, or the left, sorry, where you see the CBD flag. I actually took that picture at Columbus Farmer's Market. Um, and the picture there in the middle, that was taken out of Dick Sporting Good. And the picture on the right was actually taken uh, from a, uh, uh, one of the box stores. Um, so if you can see, there's quite a bit of proliferation of CBD products actually on the market. And that's what's driving a lot of interest in this. And if you look at here's even all the other scope of products that can be produced from hemp. And there are those who say that hemp is the miracle crop, but there, like I said, there's a wide range and you're seeing a lot more products coming on board um, with the 
with their hemp derived products, whether it's from the fibers, whether it's from the grain, the heart, or whether it's actually from the oil. And here's one of my favorites. Um, this one here is actually good for happy hour, right? There's a uh, <laughs> CBD, CBD infused beer. So the, I've, I've actually even seen it in toothpaste, um, you know, where there was CBD toothpaste. So there's an awful lot out there. And I'm not going to talk about any of the medical claims or anything like that. Uh, but as my doctor told me, Google CBD and any syndrome or any, uh, you know, any, any, anything medical on it, and you'll find somewhere, some article that links CBD to it. And as he says, buyer beware a little bit uh, when you're looking at some of these claims. All right, so how did we get here? Well, for us in New Jersey, it's the 2018 Farm Bill. That's when we came aboard. Um, 2014, the Farm Bill allowed what they called pilot projects and research projects. But the big thing that happened in 2018 is that hemp was removed from the Controlled Substances Act. So that gave us the ability um, to start growing it. Uh, there's a New Jersey actually has control of the program for under USDA uh, guidance or approval. And you'll hear us talk about the New Jersey Hemp Farming Act. And that's what you want to read and you want to get to know. Um, and Steve's going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but like I said, here's the big thing is we removed it from the Schedule 1. And I put this picture up here just to show you there's a lot of different production systems. The one on the left is actually a fiber production system. The one on the right is for CBD floral. So if you're contemplating going into hemp, you got to do a little bit of background research. Um, we always tell you to do your economic research, where you're going to market and where you're going to sell it. But particularly with this crop, it's really going to influence your production system. And you can't pivot from, you know, growing for floral all the way to uh, growing hemp real quick. Um, it's, there's actually different, they're produced a little bit differently. And this I put up here, because this is really the last time we actually grew uh, hemp actually in the state. This is where, uh, in 1937, we had what was called the Marijuana Act, which required these uh, tax stamps to produce it, basically eliminated the market. And over time, it was actually then entered into the Controlled Substance Act. So we really haven't produced hemp uh, in New Jersey uh, for quite some time. Um, I actually, in some of my research, found an old colonial law um, from New Jersey that actually offered an incentive for growing hemp. So we do have a history of growing hemp but it was more for the, you know, the fiber for growing it for paper production and for fabric. Um, they say that the, the first flag that was made by Betsy Ross was what, from a hemp derived fabric. And the last really big push, I put this up here. And if you're looking for a neat uh, video to look, do a Google search for hemp for victory. It's a, uh, it was to try to convince or we needed for the World War II effort, we needed uh, cordage you know, to be able to produce rope from hemp. And there was a movement at that time to try to increase production during the wartime efforts for hemp. But these were not for the production systems what a lot of people are interested in now, which is the CBD or the floral production system. And if you start looking into some of the, uh, the research reports and the economic analysis, long-term, once we get a supply chain going, there is a thought that we could be moving towards fiber production uh, a little bit more. So why are we interested in here in New Jersey? And this is a slide that Steve and I use, probably overuse. We use it all the time. Um, the black dot that you see in the middle there, that's roughly Princeton. But look at the rings there, how many people are. Within 100 miles, there's about 29 million people. Um, and if you look even within the uh, 25 million uh, or the 25 mile radius, there's 2.3 million people. The point I'm trying to show here, there's an awful lot of people, a lot of market potential. Um, so that's one of the things that we'll, uh, we're seeing a lot of people are having interest in hemp is because of possible market demand. You know, you get into that local grown, that identity for uh, different products. Could that transfer into hemp production, possibly into CBD production uh, and other products? You know, maybe there could be hemp seed, hemp floral products. So that's why there seems to be a, a genuine interest in it here in New Jersey. But I'm an extension and we always throw caution up to everybody. So what I thought that we would do is I want to go through and I want you to take a look at some of these questions and give some thought um, on it. I worked initially probably 20 years ago with hops and there was a big interest in hops. There's been big interest in microbreweries. So 
I don't know whether this is going to pan out long term or a fad or, if, you know, if that's what a lot of the interest is just because we're seeing a lot of it. But ask yourself some of the questions I'm going to bring up and see if you know the answers. And I would I would strongly urge you to find the answers out, you know, before you proceed. Uh, this is a very expensive crop to potentially raise when you start looking at buying clones or you buy seed um, for the floral production. It gets pretty expensive. Um, we've actually, when we purchased some clone plants this year, we were paying three and four dollars a plant. So there is a lot of real expense here. And when we talk about the regulations, you know, there's a potential not to be able to harvest your crop. So you could put a lot of money into producing a crop and not being able to harvest or sell it. So that could be a significant uh, economic impact to the farm. So these are some of the questions I like to ask is what hemp market are you growing for? And one of the reasons I bring this up is I get a lot of phone calls in the office work and extension just saying, I want to grow hemp. So the first question I'll ask is what type of hemp? Are we going to grow for fiber? Are you going to grow for seed? Or are you going to grow for CBD? And for a lot of people, it's an eye awakening experience. They just thought that hemp is hemp. And it's actually, uh, what, the way you're going to grow, as I said before, is going to be dependent on where you're going to sell it and how you're going to market it. Um, and one of the other questions I'll ask the next one on there is where are you going to sell your product? Um, do you believe that just because you grow it, people are going to buy it? And I can talk to or talk about some people I know who've grown it, who had handshake deals or they thought they would be able to sell it real easily, who actually still have product left over. And if you look at some of the national literature on it, um, there is starting to build a little bit for demand versus uh, supply. Um, like again, the other thing I have on here also is what production system are you going to use? Are you going to grow it uh, narrow seeded like you would for a fiber crop? Or are you going to grow it? Uh, we grew it on raised plastic at, on a six by six spacing system. We grew it for floral production, but there's a difference in the production systems, difference in expense, difference in cost of production, when, depending on the system you're going to use. And here's another one I like to put up there now is, do you know the production costs, including your labor? Um, it was for us, we didn't have any mechanical debudding equipment. Uh, to take the floral uh, off. So we spent a significant amount of time pulling buds from it. There's also drying. There's a lot of crop that can come in at once. So you have to dry it. Um, the, the buds or the floral, if you're going for the CBD, are very tight and there's, they're subject to uh, quality issues. You can get some real molding, uh, some other issues like that. So don't forget, you don't work for nothing. So you want to make sure you have an understanding of the economics. And the bottom one on here I like to, is, uh, do you know what a hot crop is? And I'm not talking about the next crop or a trendy crop on this. Um, unfortunately, Steve and I have firsthand knowledge of what a hot crop is. And a, a hot crop is when your THC level exceeds the allowable limit. Right now, you're allowed a 0.3% total THC content. If it goes above that, the crop actually has to be destroyed. And I'm not going to steal some of uh, Steve's thunder, but he'll he'll elaborate on what we had to do when we had our hot crop. And does anybody actually know what this is? Um, you're definitely going to want to know what it is. Um, that's the moth of a corn earworm. The uh, the corn earworm, the, uh, the the larval or the uh, the caterpillars love the buds of hemp. And they actually like to tunnel into it and cause some damage, which can cause some disease and quality issues. Um, but one thing that uh, we notice on this is on a lot of other crops, you can see it rather easily. You have the problem. These were embedded pretty deeply into the buds and you actually had to hunt for them to find them. So when you got to, you got to be uh, certain of what you know, how to identify the pests and then how you're going to come up with a management plan for it. Because this is one of the ones that we identify that's going to probably be a significant problem. And when you talk about other states like in Kentucky and some of the other uh, hemp producing areas, they've had significant problems with the, uh, the corn earworm. All right, let's ask you some more questions here. Probably putting everybody to sleep with these. But do you know what a producer's license is? Do you know what a handler's license is? Do you know how to get one? Do you know where to look for the details? Um, these are all within the Hemp Farming Act under the New Jersey Hemp Program. I would suggest you go to the Department of Agricultural website, read through these regulations and understand what they are. Um, Steve and I are both licensed hemp producers. Uh, we had to go through background check, fingerprinting to be able to get our licenses. 
um, for it. So you do need a license to produce it in the state. Um, do you know what happens if you risk pushing your CBD limits? And this was pretty eye-opening to us. Um, over a two-week period, our uh, THC levels uh, rose significantly from being acceptable to being above the limit to be able to harvest. Um, so if you you get a little bit, as I like to say, on the greedy side and push your CBD limits, you may actually get yourself in trouble because your THC levels are too high. So testing is going to be very important in monitoring those THC levels. And it could be a significant economic impact between having to destroy your crop or being able to harvest a crop. And there's going to be occasions where you're probably going to want to harvest your crop early. And uh, some of the research that we're working on lately is we want to understand what happens with these THC uh, dynamics within the plant. So some of the research that we'll talk about uh, we're going to see if we can identify patterns or ways to tell when the THC levels uh, uh, fluctuating. Um, and one of the uh, other ones I have on here is, do you know how to manage plant diseases? Um, we're in the humid Northeast. Uh, early in my career, I began working with hops. And hops moved to the West because of our disease potential. You know, we were in a very humid climate. Um, we saw a significant amount of leaf diseases this year, and there's some quality issues with our hemp. So understanding the diseases and how you're going to manage these plant diseases are going to be key to uh, producing a quality crop. Uh, we had a, a many number of diseases out there. I think we identified four or five different leaf spot diseases, and we have some pictures where the whole plant actually uh, went, went brown because of the diseases on it. Um, so that's really important. And we also noticed that there were some varietal differences, which is why I'm bringing up here, uh, do you know what varieties are acceptable for New Jersey? Beyond disease resistance, there's also a list within the Hemp Farming Act, which lists the varieties that are, you're allowed to grow within New Jersey. And if you're looking at growing for some of the CBD varieties, you know, for the CBD oils, some of those walk that line on the uh, the THC levels. So you got to be make sure that you're growing a variety that's listed as a CBD variety and keep make sure that it's uh, look at the growing history of it and see how well it's done. Now, unfortunately, we've only had one growing season here in New Jersey. So we only have experience right now our, ourselves with uh, eight or nine different varieties in the state and how they've done. And I wouldn't want to make a recommendation for us based just on one year growing. All right, so what's the difference? And again, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. Um, again, we called it I hemp, and we've actually no longer have to call it industrial hemp. We're calling it hemp. But what's the difference between hemp and marijuana? And it's a kind of a fundamental difference you want to know. Um, we've getting a lot of calls now about recreational marijuana. Those of us at Rutgers, we're not allowed to consult on the uh, recreational marijuana. We're only allowed to talk about the hemp. But if you think about sweet corn and field corn, the difference between both of them, they're both corn plants, but they're actually raised and bred for different purposes. And there's differences in the plant between the two. Um, so kind of use that as your frame of reference for the difference between, you know, marijuana and for, for hemp. And here's the big numbers, the 0.3% total THC. When you're less than that, you have hemp. Above that, you're going to have, you know, the marijuana. Um, the... The varieties from the recreational side of marijuana, they, they're significantly higher. You know, they could be 13, 15. I've seen some in the even 20%. And the industrial hemp or the hemp, we want to be at 0.3 or less. Um, we had some problems with some of the varieties that we grew this year that were actually listed as being CBD varieties that were supposed to be low THC varieties. And if you have a high THC variety, the whole game changes. You have a crop that's not harvestable. So Adrian actually had a question before you move on about this. Okay. Um, uh, is there mandated testing other than the THC limit uh, testing like within that, or is it just with the THC limit that is tested for this? Yeah, for the, on the regulatory point of view, you actually have to call the Department of Ag and have your scheduled your test. It was this year, they just changed the rule. You had to do it uh, 15 days prior to harvest. And they test for the, they actually come out, they pull the sample and they run the test for the total THC content um, on it. And that's that for the regulatory point of view, that's it. Now for CBD, if you're selling it, you can do that on your own um, with it. 
Uh, we actually had some independent analysis at some of the research labs at Rutgers, and that's how we started to understand some of the dynamics between CBD and THC. But no matter who, you, you can test as much as you want um, just to figure out where your crop is going. But from a regulatory point of view, there is that sample that's pulled by the Department of Ag. It's not pulled by anybody else, but the Department of Ag, the inspector comes out to your field and pulls the sample. Um, okay, let's talk about the markets a little bit. And this is what you really have to have an understanding of is the markets that you have for hemp and where you're gonna sell your hemp. There's a seed, a grain for food products. There's the fiber market, and then you'll hear the floral, the CBD. And everybody seems to be focused right now on the CBD. And some of the, um, the production practices are different. When you're gonna harvest is different. So before you put your plant in the ground, your seed in the ground, you have to know where I'm ultimately gonna sell it because you're not gonna be, you know, turn and say from CBD floral production, which has significantly large stems. Uh, the joke we had in the field was that like Christmas trees and then just sell those for fiber. Um, there's some unique properties, ways that you're gonna actually harvest your crop. Um, and, and here's a quick word about processors. Um, you can find a ton of articles on processors out there where they've broken ground or they're planning to build processors. You can search, you know, in, in the industry papers. Um, there are processors out there, but I don't know how many of them are really local yet. And I put this one up because there's a lot of co-ops that are forming. People are looking at, you know, being able to process different hemp products, but make sure you know where you're going to sell that crop before you uh, put anything in the ground. Here you can see here's production uh, for both grain and for fiber. And if you notice the one on the left, that's actually for fiber. It's very tightly spaced because you want long plants, tall plants, so that you get more fiber production. And on the right there is the grain. We have a rather limited market right now, unless you're maybe going to do your own milling for some of the grain on the fiber. There's a couple of steps called redding and things like that that are involved. But like I said, do your research before you, you grow any of these plants. And here's the typical fiber. You can see it's used in a lot of different things. It's used in, in hempcrete. It's used in, uh, actually, that's a car, actually, the interior of a car door there. There's a lot of different uses for the fiber. And there's an inner and an outer herd. And it has to go through a process called redding, where you have to get a microbial decomposition of the outer bark to be able to pull, pull the cordage out of it. So that's an extra step that's actually involved in it. And here you can see they're just separating the it, uh, to show you how the fibers come out on that. You'll typically leave it lay in a field uh, for a couple of weeks and turn it to let the bacteria in the field to start that decomposition. There are chemical processes to do redding, but that's an additional step that you're going to have to deal with. Um, the pharmaceutical, again, that's the CBD we're talking about, the recreational, the marijuana. And let's get it real quickly before I take some of Steve's time, just into some of the agronomy. And the reason I put this picture in here is this is actually from Canada. So there is a significant hemp mark already, market already. Canada has been growing uh, the, the fiber and the, uh, the seed hemp since 2001, I believe they've actually. So they're quite a bit ahead of us. China is a large player in the, in the hemp market. So... Don't think we're alone on this. There are established world markets for it. And a friend of mine just did a sabbatical out in Colorado. He was amazed at the scale of production for hemp, for CBD, and for other uh, products out there in Colorado. Um, so again, know your market and where you're going to sell it. Have a plan. Um, just a little bit about the plant. It's a summer annual. It's photosensitive period. Or it's very sensitive to the photo period. So why should you be concerned about that? that's going to be really important in selecting varieties. Just like when we select soybean varieties, we select varieties that are adapted to, you know, our, our area for, this, for the same reason. So we have to get a good handle on what we'll actually produce here. Well, um, it flowers according to the day length and photo period. And we have some pictures later we'll show you, which is pretty unique where it goes from being uh, alternate to opposite with the, the branching on it. And that actually signals flowering. It's uh, dioecious, which means there's male and female plants. Depending on the use, if you're growing it for CBD, you don't want male plants. Um, so you got to be aware of how to identify what a male plant is. Are you going to use feminized seed? Those are all issues that come into play. Um, again, there are some monaceous varieties that are out there. Um, there's also um, um, 
a lot of breeding work that's going on, but we haven't done that. We haven't really had this plant, uh, so to speak, quote unquote, above ground with a lot of research going on for variety development. Um, so we're kind of just starting out on some of that. Um, and again, male plants may be wanted or they may not be wanted. Um, and a lot of the stuff we're seeing is that the hemp varieties are going to be pretty specific regionally. So we have to get that database going. Here's uh, just some of the different production systems here. And if you just take a look at this, there's differences in row spacing. There's difference in the amount of nitrogen that's put down. Actually, the, the seeding rates are different. So there are differences in production systems. So keep that in mind. This is actually some Kentucky data because we've really only had one year here to do it in New Jersey. We don't have our own tables, our own specific tables. Penn State has done some work. They came up with some preliminary uh, fertility recommendations, but that's where an area that's gonna need a lot of different work uh, specific for production in our area. Um, if you're gonna grow it for seed, you're gonna probably looking at a, an early May or mid-May to June period. Um, you can see we're putting it pretty shallow. One of the things that we're looking about is trying to get rapid germination. If you're growing it from seed, to get good cover so we can outcompete the weeds. Um, there are not uh, a lot of options for trying to keep things under control um, for anything. Um, so we have to, uh, you know, try to get a quick, rapid establishment of the crop. And here's some grain that was harvested. Um, and one of the things when they're harvesting like for the seed and the grain, you gotta remember it's a commodity just like any other commodity. So the pricing you get is probably not gonna be as great. And then you have to find somebody who's willing to take it. But if you look at the picture on the right, that's from some of our colleagues in Kentucky who are using threshers. If you notice how uh, dirty that is, they actually had to run it through the thresher twice to get it that clean. Um, and somebody told me if you ever harvest it for seed, it's, it's, it's worse than actually harvesting sorghum. It's a rough thing to get through the combine. Here's your hemp for fiber. This is actually from Penn State. Uh, Greg Roth let me borrow this photo of his, but see how tall it is? It's actually not, not a lot of branching on it. And that's what you want with the tall, you want that tall for the fiber. There are systems where you'll harvest the grain up top and then what's left, you'll use, I'll call it dual use or, or hybrid production where you'll do both, uh, you'll get both crops or both um, parts of the plant harvested for, for market. Um, again, this is why it's really important to know what your market is. If you look at those plants, there's not that very many seed heads on top of that. There's not a lot of floral. So if you planted it that way, you're not really gonna get anything off of that crop there to sell in the floral market. And this is them harvesting it. This is actually um, out in, uh, I believe this one was from Kentucky. They're using a sickle bar and they're cutting it down. And that's how they're cutting it for the fiber production on this. It will then have to lay in the field and it'll have to go through redding before it's actually baled and taken to market. Um, and one of the things I put here, here's, this is actually a large baling operation. This one, I believe is up in Canada, but these are the kind of bales you're handling. And if you're trying to sell this, uh, for the fiber market, you got to figure out where your, your plant is or where you're going to sell it at because transportation is then going to become a, uh, an issue. Regionally, there's not very much processing going on um, for the hemp fiber. It's a supply chain issue from some of the people I've talked to. We have to develop the supply chain and get the marketing uh, and the ability to do some of the processing um, on it. So keep this in mind. I mean, you say you want to you want to grow it. Where are you going to grow it? Where are you going to sell it? So with that, I know I'm running on time because Steve wanted to. And again, this is just an intro to what we did at the Snyder Farm. I know Steve's going to talk about this, but these are the varieties that we grew at the Snyder Farm. We had two planting dates, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who can actually uh, tell you what we did up at the Snyder Farm on it. Oh, Steve, you are still muted uh, if you're chatting with us. Yeah, sorry about that. I, <laughs> I forgot when you start sharing your screen, it moves where all the buttons are to the top of your computer screen. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, so as Bill mentioned, we're going to uh, we're going to discuss a few a few of our research plots. Um, and uh, I'm going to touch on a couple of things uh, in the second half of this talk. I'm going to real briefly go over the uh, the New Jersey rule just to get you acclimated to where you find the answers to your questions regarding that rule. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the marketing. Um, the other side of my job, uh, I deal a lot with um, the commodities world and commodity traders and stuff. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we've uh, what we see from that from the marketing of uh, hemp products across the country in particular. Um, and now I'm going to touch on uh, our research plots. And I'm I'm really interested interested to talk to Scott after this to see how his uh, fields did this year. Um, so I'm looking forward to his talk. So I'm going to try to be as on time as possible. So, uh oh, why is it not? Oh, there we go. Uh, we all know the 2018 Farm Bill started um, the uh, uh, research into hemp uh, in New Jersey, especially. Uh, we are a little bit behind some of our colleagues from the surrounding states who took advantage of the pilot uh, program that started about four years ago, uh, or excuse me, in 2014. But uh, with the uh, passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, New Jersey quickly adapted and uh, started with the New Jersey Hemp Farming Act, which really allowed us to move forward. And as Bill suggested, um, the uh, announcement came out this after or this morning, rather, that the USDA published the final rule for the domestic hemp production problem uh, program. This link is hot right now, but it will not be uh, hot after we uh, disconnect. So if you are interested, um, just uh, copy and paste that, or maybe if somebody can copy and paste that into the chat window for me, that would be great. Um, but this will bring you right to the rule. As of yet, it's not published on the docket, but you can see what the rule is going to say when it finally is published, which goes into effect, I believe, um, the third week of March is when this uh, rule is going to be uh, implemented. So please take some time to look into that and see. Uh, Bill did a good job of sharing some of the, uh, the pretty significant changes um, that are, are going to be in the uh, federal rule, and uh, it'll certainly filter down into the individual state's uh, regulatory compliance as well. Now, Bill alluded to this, um, and I'm sure you all are aware. Um, oh, um, Amanda, are you able to get that link? Because I don't think I can get it from the screen. Uh, I'll, I'll sure. share it. Um, we could share it. Um, you want to just drop it in the chat? Can yeah, we can Bill, send it to can you, you later. Bill do that? Okay. Very good. Sorry okay. to interrupt. No, not at all. Um, so we all know supply and demand is going to rule um, the, the marketability of this crop. Um, and as more and more states are getting involved, the uh, supply is certainly going to change, as, as is the demand. Um, but as it stands today, approximately 30 countries permit hemp production. And you could see um, some of our major competitors. Uh, China has a, approximately 150,000 acres. Um, this is uh, expected to increase as they uh, buy up uh, different agricultural land um, around the country, around the world rather. Um, so there, you, you could expect to see some of our competitors overseas uh, increasing. Um, right now, US production data is difficult to quantify, but after the 2020 growing season and uh, the implementation of uh, FSA reporting, I, I think we'll be able to get a better handle on the actual production across the uh, United States. But here is, um, kind of our estimated, uh, our best guess, I guess, for um, US production. And you could see uh, some of the counties out, our states out west are producing significant acres. But I want you to really pay attention to what's in parentheses. You can see Colorado only produced 60% of the amount that was actually licensed. So states, even though they're not producing a tremendous amount of acreage compared to some of our other crops, they still have a lot of expansion that they're able to do. So you could see this is certainly going to Im impact the supply across the United States of domestic uh, hemp and hemp products. So we really want to be cautious when we're starting to uh, try to enter this market based on the cost and the uh, returns that we're seeing from previous studies. And what this really makes us think about is where does New Jersey fit into this strategy? Um, Bill did a real good job of explaining our biggest asset, um, and that is our customer base. Um, but let's talk just a little bit about what demand is out there. Everybody's kind of interested. I think most of the folks that uh, answered in the chat window uh, were interested in, in production for the CBD and CBG oils, um, mainly for the pharmaceutical use or the self-help type uses um, and the various other uh, reported benefits of the CBD oils. Grain is also a really important component of uh, industrial hemp and hemp production. In fact, there's a lot of speculation in the commodities world that both the grain and fiber markets are really going to be 
where hemp products are going to really take their foothold across the country. Um, as Bill mentioned, uh, uh, particularly when we think about the fiber products, they're used in an awful lot of industrial uses, um, and we could grow it re relatively economically. And if we can uh, maintain that market, there's, there's going to be a pretty viable market for both grain and fiber products as well. Where we fit in in New Jersey in that regard is uh, frankly something that Bill and I are going to start looking at in the coming years. Um, Scott, I know you did some, uh, some grain in the past couple of years too, so I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on that as well when we start to have a discussion. Um, and we could certainly expect that with this increase in domestic production, we could expect to see and we could possibly see a reduced import uh, market, and hopefully that would, uh, would benefit the uh, availability of demand for our products grown domestically. And you could see by this graph down at the bottom, you could see a pretty steady increase in anticipated um, uh, use and demand for hemp-based products. So the demand is certainly there and folks are really um, are eager to get into this marketplace. This is just some, uh, some numbers from a, a report uh, last uh, January, and it's anticipated that $1.9 billion in U.S. hemp products um, by uh, 2022. Uh, latest estimates are kind of increasing this um, prediction, but you could see tremendous growth in industrial applications as well as in hemp-derived uh, CBD and CBD products. So as you can imagine, there's a tremendous issue, um, interest in both of these type of products. Bill already showed us this slide, but I wanted to uh, stress a couple parts. We have a tremendous customer base in the Northeast, especially um, when we consider New Jersey. And uh, one thing that Bill left out about this slide, within this, uh, in the red band or the red circle, where you can see there was 29 million people, they have an annual income, not an annual net worth, but an annual income of a little bit over $1 trillion. So, we have tremendous market potential. In fact, we are the envy of most agricultural states at what we have as our potential for, uh, for sales and customers. So it is a really important thing to consider when we're thinking about our demand, especially if we're looking at locally produced products. I'm gonna to touch on just a few of the uh, marketing uh, strategies for uh, some of the different uh, types of products. Um, seed and grain marketing, uh, in the the seed and grain market, uh, traditionally, uh, the varieties uh, or cultivars are sold much like any other commodity. Um, New Jersey and the Northeast is a little bit different in this in that we have a tremendous opportunity for uh, value added and niche type uh, processing. Um, so we could envision uh, folks uh, milling into flowers. Um, Scott, I don't mean to throw you under the bus, but I believe you were doing some of this um, in the past couple of years. So, so it's becoming a, a really um, sought after uh, crop and the products and value added products associated with them is a really good opportunity for us based on our customers. Um, it's certainly a new and developing market. And with any new and developing market, we're going to have to feel our way through it. In fact, um, we won't be able to see where this sits on the commodities and on the trading floors until there's three years of production data and pricing. Um, but we can anticipate this being a traded crop on the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, in the coming years. Um, so there is going to certainly be contract growing opportunities to meet uh, certain uh, demands and quality parameters in the future. Um, and again, the market is certainly developing. Um, anecdotal evidence certainly suggests that there's an opportunity for organic grain and flour production. Um, since this crop is uh, very limited in any of the uh, crop protection chemicals that we uh, might use in a traditional production strategy, it lends itself very well to organic production and the demand for uh, organic grains and flour is certainly um, something that's getting a lot of people's interest. Um, and it certainly offers the opportunity for tremendous niche marketing opportunities. Fiber marketing, and uh, Bill had mentioned fiber has several uses. Um, just like the grain market, the uh, fiber market is, is developing. Um, right now, there is very limited processing throughout the United States, not just locally. Um, while this is a, a negative on some regards, it could also be an opportunity for uh, small scale and niche producers to, uh, to start um, processing hemp fiber into various products locally. Um, Post-harvest production and management certainly is a concern as uh, Bill alluded to some of the uh, 
extra extra steps that we have to take um, through the writing process and, and harvesting of the uh, hemp for fiber. The market, just like the grain market, the market is certainly developing. Um, and once it is a, a, tr a crop that could be on the a trading situation, there will be outlets for uh, secondary uh, markets for the for the crop, um, which will be beneficial to uh, several several different producers. Um, once again, there's a, a tremendous opportunity for organic fiber production, um, and uh, it fits very well into an organic production uh, strategy, um, especially uh, when we're looking at uh, incorporating it into uh, some of our manures and compost uh, for the uh, nitrogen requirement for this crop. So I, I think it will fit very nicely into an organic situation. And once again, there's uh, great opportunities um, for niche marketing. I mean, this is a, a picture of uh, some hemp cord uh, that was locally produced that, um, again, we could envision this being a, a really nice niche market for some of our producers in the future. Now, everybody here, uh, at least most folks on this call, were uh, interested in CBD marketing. Um, there's no question that CBD clearly is the hot topic. As you can see from this graph, um, hemp CBD products going through 22 is uh, expected to increase exponentially. Um, Post-harvest production and management, I'm going to show you a few examples of this from our uh, uh, research studies from the past growing season, but post-harvest production and management is certainly going to be a concern. Um, as Bill alluded to during his presentation, all of this product is going to come off at the same time, or at least the vast majority of it. So uh, holding back our, our uh, crop is going to become something that we're going to need to do to manage our pricing strategies. Um, there certainly is an or opportunity for organic production. In fact, uh, most folks that are growing it are, are raising it organically or with very limited um, conventional uh, fertilizer. Uh, there's several opportunities and several businesses that are going out there um, for niche marketing opportunities. Uh, some of the ones that I'm aware of are some boutique uh, type uh, oil concentrates. Um, there's an awful lot of interest in smokable bud. Uh, throughout the state. There's a lot of folks that are starting um, some, some very unique strategies for marketing uh, smokable buds. Um, we are going to pay attention to any regulatory concerns associated with that because there are a little bit of extra, extra scrutiny as far as quality um, that goes into, into that market especially. Um, but what's really crucial and really important is to understand the consumer demand. Um, we saw a lot of really, really high prices in the uh, Early, stay, early days of this crop, and a lot of folks got excited and thought they were going to um, be able to produce it and folks are going to buy it. Well, now the market is definitely tightening up, and so we really have to understand what our customer wants, whether it's the final customer through a niche marketing type strategy or if we're going to try to sell it wholesale or on the, on the commodities market in the future. Um, so we really do want to understand what we plan on doing with it. Bill alluded to this already, but it's really important that we understand the risks associated with, uh, with uh, hemp products especially. Um, we're really, really restricted. We're either going to have a crop that we can sell, especially when we're thinking about CBD, or it's something that we cannot sell. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this determination occurs towards the end after we've already spent all our money on the crop. So we really want to understand the risks associated with production before we get into it. Um, as Bill said, it's a really pricey crop um, relative to some of our other more traditional crops, and there's very few secondary markets. So our strategy has to be really, uh, really precise, and we really have to understand these risks and do everything we can to mitigate them. Uh, crop insurance is uh, certainly working. We're working its, our way through the crop insurance concerns. Um, Previously, we said there were no label pesticides, but there are now few label pesticides. Um, the vast majority of these are, um, are uh, organic, uh, organic type pesticides and certified for organic production. Um, I only know of one that is not certified for organic production, but this is certainly going to change um, as interest gets uh, more and more uh, potent throughout the, uh, the production and agricultural production. Um, we're certainly still feeling our way through the consumer demand. We're really paying a lot of attention to what the markets are, what marketing strategies are working, and uh, what the consumer really wants. Again, whether we're talking about a processing 
facility that wants to uh, buy raw material or if we're talking about an individual customer or consumer who wants to buy the product in a niche marketing uh, situation. Um, processing is a tremendous concern. Um, we, some folks are very, very lucky and, and uh, have very nice marketing and pro processing outlets. Uh, some folks grow the crop and then wonder where they're going to um, where they're going to process it. So we really want to pay attention to uh, the post harvest and processing strategies as we move forward with this crop. I don't want to be too much of a wet blanket, but as we start looking at more of the traditional uh, sales avenues for uh, hemp products, we are noticing a, a pretty significant downward price trend. Um, and for those of you that are in other, other uh, more conventional crops, uh, we've seen this happen before, haven't we? Um, we get a new crop that comes out and there's really, really high demand. The price goes through the roof. But as you can see, regardless of the type of, crop, of, type of product that we're uh, marketing here, these are all uh, refined hemp oils. Um, it's not important to know what they are, but I really want you to pay attention to this downward pricing trend. Um, so we really have to be considerate of that as we're moving forward. And it's going it's to going become, to oh, oh, oh. it's going to become gonna be like any other any crop. Up, oh, somebody has their speaker on, I think. Uh, where we're going to be concerned with our pricing strategies and our, our cost of production strategies to uh, make this crop as effective and profitable as possible. Going to switch gears just a little bit to uh, bring you your attention to the importance of regulatory compliance. Uh, this was our first year navigating the system um, and the Department of Agriculture through their hemp, uh, New Jersey Hemp Farming Act. Um, they have a, a, a really good team that's working to, uh, to help us through the process. I'm not gonna get into all the different strategies, but there are several steps and several different uh, forms that you have to send to the department uh, at various stages throughout the production season. Um, and this is a link again, that will bring you to the Hemp Farming Act, whether you're interested in starting and an, an applying uh, for your permit for the next growing season, or if you're extending your uh, 2020 uh, license into 2021, um, this would be where you would go. Um, but it's really important to understand the steps. Um, we, we navigated it very effectively, but you really do have to keep on your reporting with this crop. It's not as simple as carrying it to the elevator when we're done at the end of the growing season and keeping track of our yields, you really do have to pay attention and you have to tell them as you're going through the process. Um, so I would definitely get uh, comfortable and uh, understand where this website is and understand uh, how you have to comply with the regulations. And I just wanna reiterate, it's really important to know, understand and follow these rules. Um, the general provisions, and I'm not going to read this to you, but I wanted you to uh, see, especially this section B, where it talks about growers, processors, and handlers. There's different types of licenses that you can apply for. Um, some folks are all three. Uh, Bill and I are, are just growers and handlers. So there's different licenses depending on what you're going to do and how you're going to handle the crop after it leaves your field. So really pay attention to this, and, and it's really important, especially with this crop, to know, understand, and follow these rules. And uh, Bill and I are certainly around to, to assist, but the Department of Agriculture uh, really would be the place to go to um, for specific questions about this rule. Just another thing I really wanted you to pay attention to, there are fees associated with this program. And if you could see down at the bottom, I just put an example of a hemp producer who also processes for others. So you would need a grain uh, pay a grower fee for grain, a grower fee for the hemp oil and CBD extracts. So your, your total licensing for the year for both to be a grower, a handler, and a processor would be about $2,450. Um, so it's just really important to understand uh, what the fees and, and how you need to pay them depending on what type of operation you're running. I just put this uh, picture of the applicate or uh, the actual license up here just so you recognize what it looks like. Um, there's some talk about modifying this to uh, making it a little bit more official, but this is how it looks right now. So just for example, if you are a processor or a handler, you would want to understand what, what the real license looks like. Um, but as the uh, rule and the program progresses, I'm sure these licenses will change um, in design and style 
and uh, how they're accepted by um, other operations throughout the state. Right, 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 right. One more thing that's really important to understand is through this hemp program, there is a, summer of, uh, a summary of varieties that are either of concern for production due to THC spikes or that are flat prohibited to grow in New Jersey. Now, we do kind of borrow the uh, Kentucky's state program for this, but in coming years, we are gonna amend, or not we, the uh, Department of Agriculture is going to amend um, some of these varieties based on uh, our research program at Rutgers, as well as what they're seeing in the field. Um, but I just wanted you to understand there's some varieties that are prohibited. Uh, we're, we're finding uh, uh, sources of, of cultivars and plant material from all over the country and frankly, uh, the, the Northern hemisphere. Um, so you really wanna pay attention to make sure that the cultivar that you might be wanting to bring in uh, to New Jersey is accepted for production here. And this is just an example of what it looks like. And as you could see, varieties of concerned are tagged and uh, varieties that are uh, outright prohibited for production and bringing into the state of New Jersey are labeled in red. So really get familiar with this and understand uh, what varieties and cultivars that you're interested in producing. Finally, since this is um, now regulated by the federal government and uh, reporting is actually going through the FSA, uh, Farm Service Agency, so it's really important to understand how you actually report your crop acreage, whether it's your intended acres in the beginning or your actual uh, harvested acres and production. Um, so if you are producing uh, any of the other crops and are familiar with the FSA, it's important to, uh, to report your acres to them. If you're new to it, I suggest you reach out to the Farm Service Agency rep in your uh, region and uh, understand how your reporting requirements are going to be um, for this crop. Uh, it's, it's really critical for, uh, for several reasons, including down the road if there are any payments associated um, with hemp disasters. So real quickly, I just wanted to uh, switch gears and give you a little overview of our 2020 CBD hemp variety trial. Uh, we, we certainly learned an awful lot uh, over this study and uh, we learned even more from our mistakes. Uh, Bill and I often joke around that uh, it's better for us to make all these mistakes so you don't have to make them and cost a lot of money to your operation. But we are gonna share some of our mistakes with you this week uh, that we had this past year. I'm not gonna go over too much of the, uh, the experimental design here, but we did do this study in Pittstown, New Jersey uh, at the Snyder Research Farm. Uh, it's a very, very good soil for crop production in general. As you can see here, we did some uh, basic uh, preparation. We did put uh, black, uh, black pl plastic mulch on raised beds on six foot centers where we were able to uh, fertigate this crop throughout the growing season. We did put it on a six by six grid um, and we were growing this specifically for CBD production. And as we alluded to before, since we did not have any uh, recommended uh, herbicides or, or insecticides, we did not use any uh, any chemical treatments on this field. We did put uh, a wheat straw in the row middles um, to uh, control weeds. And we were rather successful in managing our weed control throughout the entire growing season. We maybe went a little heavy um, on our, uh, on our uh, mulch laying, but it did a phenomenal job in uh, weed control. Not gonna bore you with um, the experimental design here, but we did look at eight cultivars. However, six of them were planted extremely late. And if you recall, when Bill was giving his presentation, he told you that we were, if we got into mid June, we, we kind of think we're late. Um, these uh, other varieties went in about the second week of July. So we really thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of test the thresholds for uh, some of these varieties. Um, and some of them were successful, but we're only gonna focus on today uh, two, the two cultivars that were evaluated, um, Electra and Suver Hayes. And why we selected these uh, for a couple of reasons, it was one of the predominantly grown CBD cultivars um, in the region, especially in the uh, uh, southern tier of New York and into uh, the northern part of New Jersey. We did transplant them by hand. Uh, Bill alluded to this before that this crop is uh, uh, quite um, labor intensive. And we planted these in a 10, uh, 10 plants per grid on a six by six grid again, just to give you an idea of what we did. 
Now, harvest and those of you that have grown it in the, this past growing season are fully aware. Um, due to the uh, constraints from COVID this year, we were unable to utilize some of our uh, our more techie kind of harvesting equipment that we uh, hope to order for this growing past growing season. So we did it the old fashioned way. We hand pruned uh, with loppers. Um, we hand trimmed each branch and uh, we put it into uh, this hemp bud harvester that we found um, on the internet, frankly. Um, and, and we did it all by hand. It was extremely labor intensive. On average, each individual plant took us a little over an hour to harvest and prepare the buds for sampling. Um, so until we really get into some of the uh, technologies, we are going to be very uh, labor intensive in our harvest and management for this crop. I just wanted to show you a couple of our data slides, not necessarily to share the data with you, but just to show you some of the trends. One of the things that we were really interested in looking at is the production differences between these two cultivars. And as you can see, we noticed some pretty significant differences in height. Um, so it really reiterates and reinforces the importance of us picking the correct cultivars for production. Whether we're going to try to get uh, tighter rows and get a plant on smaller grid spacings, or if we're going to try to plant less plants and really maximize production, um, picking the right cultivar is going to be crucial to, uh, for this, especially when we're talking about CBD or THC concentrations. And I'm going to talk a little bit in just a minute about how they're related. Once again, the yield um, were very similar for these plant, these two cultivars. Um, and you could see the, uh, the dry yields in this amber uh, or orange color bar. We, after we dried it down, we, we did dry it in a, a, a tobacco dryer at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and we got, uh, we got the buds uh, fairly dry. Um, so we did lose a tremendous amount of, of yield weight um, uh, due to moisture. But you can see they were very similar. And uh, we noticed this trend. We are a little bit on the low side um, in our yields. I think a lot of this had to do with the fact that we were still a little bit late in getting our crop into the field. Um, and that's another thing that we're really interested in looking at in the future is uh, optimal planting times and optimal harvest times uh, to maximize the productivity. This is a, one interesting thing where there was a lot of discussion about how should we harvest for compliance um, in, in the literature and amongst some of our colleagues. So Bill and I took subsamples from each of the plants, whether we were at the bottom third of the plant, the middle third of the middle of the plant or the top third of the plant. And as you can see, um, we did not see any significant yield differences in CBD across the plant. Um, but we did notice a slight trend where with the uh, Suver Haze variety, where the CBD concentrations did tend, not significantly um, from a scientific point of view, but we did notice a trend towards more CBD production at the top third of this plant. So once again, the, how these individual cultivars react, the purity of the cultivars and such are gonna be something that we really wanna pay a lot of attention to in the future. Okay, the real big one, and Bill alluded to this, total THC. Um, anybody have a guess on what that red line represents? It's the uh, compliance threshold. And as you can see from this, when we did our um, compliance sampling, we were uh, well hot for um, THC levels in this variety, uh, or in these two cultivars, excuse me. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why we think this happened. Some of it was uh, timing lists of, of harvest. And this really just emphasizes the importance of following your crop throughout the growing season and really um, determining your, where you are in your CBD relative to your THC concentrations. This really brought up the importance to Bill and I to not push our crop to increase our CBD concentration. So I just want to set up this slides for just a second. On the top left of this, you can see the graph with two bars. What we did was we sampled for THC on 916 and then again on 106. So in just a few weeks afterwards, as you can see in the Electra, we had a pretty significant increase in our, our CBD concentration, as you can see from this lower right slide or lower right graph. We didn't see so much of a spike over time in our CB, uh, CBD concentration in the Suver Haze. We had a relatively flat 
right in the uh, nine to 10 uh, percent range. But as you can see in our lecture, we went from a little under eight to well over 11 percent CBD in just that short window of time. So we might be tempted to push some of these cultivars to maximize our CBD production, but look what happened in this top left. We had almost a mirror image in THC concentration spikes for both of these two cultivars. So we went from significantly over to very significantly over our threshold for THC uh, across this period of time. So we really wanna pay a lot of attention to this relationship between CBD concentration and THC concentration and understand that this is gonna be dramatically different for different cultivars. So this is something that we really are gonna to have to pay a lot of attention uh, in the future. In fact, we're gonna do next year, we're gonna do some research looking at once it goes to flower, what the THC and CBD concentrations are over time to kind of maximize when we should be harvesting these crops. We also ran into several production challenges. I'm gonna run through these real quickly. Probably the first one we, we ran into this year, and Scott, I would imagine you did as well. We had a, a storm come through and blew over the vast majority of our crop. Um, this led us to having to stand them all back up and stake them. So plant standability is certainly gonna be a concern. We're not sure if this was due to our raised beds or due to where the crop was in its uh, physiological maturity, but anything that was of any size, which is where we would have been at the time of the storm, got completely blown over, not broken over, but just completely blown over, um, which made us had to stake it. So plant standability is gonna be a tremendous concern. Bill alluded to it, we did have um, several insect pests that caused damage to this crop. Um, the, the ones of, of real note, we, we did notice um, uh, several stink bugs in the plot. Uh, interesting enough, we actually confirmed in our research plots the cannabis aphid. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple slides of some of the uh, uh, beneficials that we had that kind of will help defend against some of these pests. But we did uh, report the first case of, of confirmed uh, cannabis aphid in our plots at Snyder Farm. Probably the biggest pest that we saw in our crops is the corn earworm and tobacco budworm complex. Uh, we did confirm uh, both species in our plots this past growing season. And you could see here, this bud is completely decimated. Some of these buds we counted as high as five, uh, five small larvae, which are creating a tremendous impact on both the quality and the yield of this crop. Probably one of the biggest problems associated with this pest is it allows for secondary uh, pathogens to get in and cause us pretty significant quality um, problems for the crop as we move further on down, especially if we're looking into the smokable bud market or into the uh, processing post-harvest um, for uh, the cannabinoid oils. As I mentioned before, we did notice um, several ladybug beetles, ladybird beetles, and we also did start to notice uh, cirifid larvae in the of both beneficial insects, which are really good to have in our field, when, especially when we're thinking about uh, aphid production. We did have several diseases and I'm real quickly just gonna tell you what they were. We had a uh, Cercospora proven. Um, you can see in the lower right towards the end of the growing season, we had tremendous botrytis um, uh, problems in the field, which are certainly all gonna cause uh, damage for uh, quality and yield. And you could see from here, this one plant on the center of this, the top center was completely decimated by this disease. Um, this isn't a plant that was planted later or anything like that. It was completely killed by the disease. So disease management um, is going to be a tremendous concern. Um, we, we certainly have these issues um, in a lot of our crops, especially our high value crops in New Jersey. Um, if you're not an uh, organic producer, we do not have any conventional fungicides that are labeled for this. There are some, uh, uh, some uh, protecting chemicals that are out there that are uh, organic approved as well, um, but we have not done any studies to see the efficacy. We will do that um, in the coming growing season. We also noticed um, some uh, uh, other disorders. Uh, the one on the right we believe is just a physiological response to flowering. Um, and the one on the left we believe is probably phosphorus uh, deficiency. Uh, later on in the growing season. Um, we did not confirm this with tissue testing yet, um, but we do have samples to run for tissue sampling um, 
the tissue test to see if that is indeed uh, phosphorus. Probably the biggest um, concern that we found uh, through our growing of this crop this year is THC compliance. Now, this is just to give you all a visual representation of our small, this is two varieties in our small plot uh, study that was a little bit under uh, 0.07 acres. So as you can see, this is a traditional hay wagon. We, we had it pretty well filled um, with, with plant material that could have been harvested if we did not um, max or meet the threshold for THC. Mm -hmm. um, and this is ultimately what we had to do with our crop. Um, we were deemed to be non-compliant and we oh, had no. to destroy the entire crop. So it's really critical. Uh, we, Bill and I certainly still got our paycheck at the end of the day. Um, but if you're investing an awful lot of money into this crop, the THC spikes and THC compliance is going to be a critical aspect of this crop production that we're not used to. We usually have a secondary market for our coals and things of that nature in some of our other crops. But with this crop, if you're not compliant, you do not get to sell it, you have to destroy it. Um, so that's something that we really have to uh, reinforce the importance of, of following your THC and CBD spikes. Um, and moving forward, I just wanted to stress that cultivar selection is going to be- There's a question, Steve. Did you get a violation from the state against your license for that? No, 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 we're a research entity, so we were, we're okay. Um, okay, so Marcus, don't worry about Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'm, I, I still get to work. <laughs> um, there, there are certain levels of THC where you would get a violation in, and, and we didn't test these levels, thank goodness, but I believe we probably would have if we surpassed the threshold. Um, so there are thresholds where you are a, a, a higher order of violator. So you really need to follow the rule and understand that. I think Bill showed you some in his talk. And Steve, um, before you move on, with all those pests, Jennifer Reardon is asking, hey, um, what about greenhouses? Have you tried growing in greenhouses? Uh, we did not. We um, Some growers did uh, produce it in greenhouses. There, there are certainly... Um, insect pests that are going to be a concern even in, in greenhouse production. Um, they're a little bit uh, easier. I don't want to say easier, but they're a different management strategies for a lot of the pests that would be in greenhouses. Um, I do not have any experience. I'm a, I'm a field crop guy. So I, we didn't grow any in the greenhouse, but some of our colleagues did. Um, and some of the producers that we're working with did um, rather successfully for the first season. Um, so that is an, an alternative it, people are tending to think that greenhouse production is going to go to the, the higher uh, CBD oil production uh, type marketing strategies because there's certainly more um, investment required for the greenhouse production. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in greenhouse production for growing it for that other purpose that Bill and I are not allowed to discuss at this time. Um, it's, Steve, uh, real quick, they remember they had a disease down at the Rarick Center where it was unmarketable. It failed down near the greenhouse trial. Yeah, they had a, a powdery mildew, I think, really bad in their greenhouse yeah. trial this, this past growing season. So, yeah, um, there are certainly going to be disease pests in greenhouses as well. Um, the uh, uh, Touching on the disease management, disease management is going to be critical. Um, we noticed some pretty significant uh, losses in quality. Um, certainly yield and marketability caused by disease. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics, but I do know of some producers who lost agreements due to the marketability that was pretty well caused by late harvest um, and late season disease pests or uh, uh, disease problems. Insect management is certainly going to be something that we have to focus a lot of our energy on um, as well. And uh, Scott, I know you're going to talk about uh, some harvest and, and post-harvest management so I think that's going to be really important as well moving forward. And certainly marketing. I, I can't stress the importance of marketing and having a marketing strategy for how you're going to get rid of this crop. Uh, we're hearing lots and lots of stories of folks that are sitting on pretty significant amount of, uh, of buds and without a market for them. So I can't uh, emphasize enough the importance of having a marketing strategy before trying this crop. And if I can ask you all just a favor, um, if you can click on this link or if uh, somebody can bring it into the chat window, As a matter of fact, I'll bring it in the chat window so I don't take any of Scott's time, any more of it, that is. Um, 
if you don't mind just clicking on this survey and, and filling it out for us, we would certainly appreciate it. And I'm gonna stop sharing. You definitely drop it in the chat and I will post it online as well. There you All go, right. it's in there. It only takes two you. minutes, it's real short. <laughs> Walks on water hyphenated, just kidding. So I think we're over to Scott. Mr. Okay, all right. Uh, I think I am here. I am going to attempt to share this presentation. Um, and sharing. All right, um, I'm new at this. Can you all see my presentation? Oh. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. we got it. Thank you. Um, okay, so lots of good stuff brought up um, by Steve and Bill. Um, lots of shared experience um, in terms, uh, I mean, a lot of the elements discussed. Um, I'll, I'll follow along with my slideshow here and, and see if I can touch base with my notes uh, as I go. A um, little bit of timeline, you can see the dates on the slideshow. Um, these first few slides are going to really display how quick this crop progresses. Um, that kind of plays into the end of crop scenarios of how quickly it can develop THC where you don't want it and CBD where you do. Um, May 20th, June 6th, dramatic difference uh, just in the greenhouse as a transplant. Um, here we've got from, um, so from June 6th there on the right to transplanting just yeah, 15, 16 days later, uh, you're out in the field. Um, I'll skip down here. Then you're, you're at well-established plants by, by early July, a week or 10 days later. You can see in five days, they've nearly doubled in size. Um, talk about diseases. We saw this um, uh, sclerotinia. You can see the small black dots there on the stem. If my cursor is showing up and kind of the white mold that results, it's hard to know which came first, the, the sclerotinia or the, the white mold, or are they all kind of part of the same? The short answer is that plants don't like wet feet. Um, they want a lot of water to grow, but they don't want to be waterlogged. Um, we're growing in a fairly heavy buck soil, so a kind of a, a clay silt loam um, with some, you know, wet spots in the field being being problematic. Um, some areas of the field we had we had significant losses of, of plants. Um, so let's see, go back. So July 8th, you can see you're looking at plants that are maybe 24 inches tall and, and almost the same size around. Um, about a month later, you're standing in the middle of a field. These are planted on six foot centers. You can see in the distance uh, a, a, an SUV um, and an eight foot fence. Standing there, these are already five foot tall and pretty much five foot around. Um, they, they fill the space like goldfish. Um, real vigorous, real big growers. We used very similar nutrient expectations to what we saw in the slides earlier. Um, about 50 pounds the acre of nitrogen pre-planting with a little bit of um, additional nitrogen um, fed in through the, through the drip irrigation. Um, they start to develop the, the, the flower set real early. This, all that, what I'm showing was grown for, um, for flower. Um, so Scott, did you see any of the pests that Bill and Steve were talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, primarily problems with the cornier worm, uh, probably had tobacco 
bud worm without even recognizing it. Um, just assumed it was all kind of corn earworm. They are amazing at adapting to their surroundings. So they look exactly like the flower as it develops. Um, hmm. In some cases, they would burrow into the bud into the stem near the top and you would lose just the top inch or two of a, of a, of a productive flower. In some cases they would burrow in deeper and you would lose, you know, the top foot. Um, this, you know, major significant portions of the plant would be affected. Um, we did find that, that with lower levels um, at harvest during the dry down process, um, we did not use a tobacco dryer. We used kind of a modified greenhouse, uh, which we'll see some pictures of later. Um, a lot of it, a lot of them did fall out. So as the, as the accelerated dry down in our drying environment, as that progressed, um, it became less habitable. The, the, the bugs kind of fell out. We definitely saw molds as well. Um, but again, it's kind of field, field management to, to control that botrytis. Okay. So I asked Steve and Bill when we prepped for this presentation, what they suggested in terms of those pests. And they said, oh, that's next year's <laughs> task. So <laughs> do you have anything to add to that, Scott? Sadly, no. Um, a lot of our cultural practices on the organic farms will help reduce that. Um, just kind of good populations of beneficial insects, lots of wasps flying around that might harass or, or otherwise predate these things. Um, but especially if you're growing for the smokable flower market, you really, there's nothing that's labeled. This has been an illegal crop for years. The, the uh, EPA doesn't, doesn't recognize it as a crop that would be on a label and the label is the law. So if you're not clandestine, which none of us are, uh, we're growing under licenses, you, there's nothing really you can use, or there's, as Bill pointed out, there's, there's very little you can use that's, that's labeled for hemp. Um, there may be even less, if nothing, depending on where you're marketing. Again, um, the gentleman from Rutgers pointed out that marketing, marketing, marketing is what it's all about. You have to know who you're selling to, to make decisions around how you're going to manage pest disease, things like that. Um, pesticide saying, residues can show up. Yeah, Steve's saying maybe trap crops could work for organic production. They could, trap crops, I mean, it's been something that's been touted for years for a lot of different things. Trap crops are just one more thing to manage. And from my experience, um, it's hard enough to manage your cash crops and cash crops, or rather trap crops can almost make things worse at times. Okay. Um, so do a, you think a, we should, sorry, do you think we should ask, um, our friends at the beneficial insect lab to look into, a something for this? Uh, that would be great. Yeah. If there's a, if the, I mean, I, years ago, I think we'll find that years ago, um, corn earworm or possibly European corn borer. I'm forgetting which at the top of my head right now, uh, does have a predatory wasp. Um, it is releasable for things like sweet corn. Um, maybe you could release it. The difficulty is when these worms set in, it's late in the season. It tends to be at a point in the year where our growing degree, gate, growing de degree days are high. Insects are proliferating at an enormous rate. Um, and the beneficial insects, if they're not well established on your farm, if you don't already have an ecosystem, um, it would be hard to, to put something in place at a rapid scale. Um, okay. On the slideshow is a picture of, of some stuff in a greenhouse grown in pots. Um, there is the risk. So when you move out of the field, you remove the risk uh, or you reduce the risk of the gray mold the botrytis that, that really deteriorates the, the flower particularly, but as, as was shown, can take the whole plant down. But as you move into the greenhouse, you get hot and dry, you increase the risk for powdery mildew. Um, it's gotta be managed with cultural methods. You don't wanna to fertilize too much. You don't wanna over irrigate. You don't wanna under irrigate. It's, it's really 
it's why farming is a profession. You've got to be able to find the Goldilocks zone for your conditions, for your airflow, for your management style. Um, and, and, and there's challenges both in the field and in the greenhouse. Um, I did see in the chat earlier a reference to, to growing for personal use. I would love to encourage it. And I can say more than, than the gentleman from Rutgers, but, but you can't. There's no allowance right now under our hemp rules or, um, or, or, or the, 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 what it doesn't look like anyway from the um, um, recreational marijuana that there will be an allowance for, for personal use or personal production. Um, Without bearing, I mean, you could grow for yourself if you wanted to bear all of those costs that were listed, um, but you'd have to make yourself a grower. You'd have to pay the license fee. Um, the crop is amazing. It grows really fast. It's really beautiful. Um, I would love to be able to grow it without all of the restrictions um, as a cover crop. Um, it, it comes on so strong, so fast that if you were able to, to get seed at a reasonable cost with no interest in genetics for CBD, THC, any of it, the plant itself could smother a million other weeds for you. Um, but despite its growing levels of legalization, it's still got huge amounts of restriction. Um, at harvest for the CBD crop, we're looking at tr pickup truck loads of biomass that has to be handled um, by hand um, with scissors. It, it, it's a lot of work. Um, it's, it's, it's sticky, it's problematic. Um, here's uh, the way we really dried things down. We, we took a greenhouse, we covered it with um, silage tarps to block out sun. Uh, it's important for drying down into quality. Um, you don't want it to get these, these kind of hay-like notes to the, to the smells. Um, so it needs to dry without sunlight. Um, you can see it there hanging on, um, you buy it for the flower production. It's called Hortnova. It's a, a loose plastic netting. Um, we hung the buds from that for the, the, the colas, the very top buds that we thought would sell the best and be most attractive for flower sales. Um, and then the, the, the more kind of biomass we bunched, um, and, and hung from the rafters. This greenhouse, I don't know if you can see it in the picture. Um, I'll sh it's in this one on the right. You can see we rented dehumidifiers. We rented extra fans. Um, the greenhouse was running its vent fans to just do absolutely everything we could to, to keep the humidity down. The difficulty is that we're harvesting in Pennsylvania, New Jersey in um, the, the fall. It's, it's humid, it's wet, the air is wet, it's hard to get stuff to dry. So the, in the back corner of the picture on the right, you can see we have a modified shipping container that we set up with air conditioners to dehumidifiers. Um, that worked very well, but it was an energy intensive, expensive proposition. Um, the, the bulk bags that you see lining the sides of that container contained the biomass that had been dried in the uh, in the tunnels. Um, this shipping container was used to preserve the dried crop. Um, points brought up about marketing, marketing, marketing. In the profile analysis on the left, you can see that this one, this, this would have passed um, under the initial rules. Uh, point th le less than 0.3% THC. Um, Lots of CBD made it very marketable. Um, Pennsylvania worked under its initial rules last year. I don't know if this would have um, My internet is unstable. Um, uh, in terms of marketability, um, at market time, the prices seem to bottom out. They get to be maybe, ridiculous. Maybe you could turn off your camera. 
Yeah, sure. If I'm breaking up, I, I, yeah, I can do that. Um, maybe. Um, but much like you would with uh, commodity grains, uh, the ability to not only get these this product dried um, down nice and low so that you won't grow molds, but then to be able to um, to keep it at a low moisture content. Um, the market, the, the, the price point does seem to, to spring back, or at least it did last year. Um, late January, early February into March. So the, everybody bought as much as they could at the lowest prices possible at harvest time in the fall, early winter. Um, and then they've run it through their processing facilities and they're starting to look for more uh, here in the, in the late winter, early spring. So if you set yourself up with the ability to kind of silo what you grow, um, you will be able to sell it again at a, at a, at a more reasonable price a little bit later in the year. Um, that being said, we got to the end of 2020 and just flat out threw away at least one of these super sacks, um, because there was, there was fresh bud coming out of the field and, and, and the market opportunity had gone away. Um, there was fresher, better stuff to sell. So with marketing, relationships are huge. If, if you don't know, truly, truly know who it is that you're selling to, be thoughtful. Um, there's a lot of shady actors uh, in, in the marketplace right now. Um, we do sell some at, uh, our farmer's market in, um, Philadelphia. Um, that's a tiny portion of the sales. Most of it went to, um, some wholesale buyers, um, that, that relationships have been cultivated with. Um, and there were a lot, there were just so many instances of, um, you know, we thought we had a deal. We thought we had you know, a thousand pounds going to be sold and, um, and, and that just disintegrated. Um, that's the end of, of my slideshow. I'm happy to continue to, to throw in, um, from the notes that I took, uh, again, what the, what Bill and Steven presented previously touched on a lot of the experiences that I had, um, in, in growing as well. Uh, I will quick touch on, on grain production. Um, New Jersey's fees were a little bit high for my taste for growing a questionable grain crop, a crop that I didn't know how I was going to sell or how much of it was, was going to grow or whether they were going to condemn it before I even got to sell it. Um, so I did not grow any hemp in New Jersey um, in 2020. Uh, I only participated in the growth of, uh, under the PA license uh, with the friends of mine over in Bucks County. So Scott, so, I think there are a bunch of questions about the seeds. Okay, uh, let oh, me see if I can- Amanda. Yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> Amanda, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss it back to you to- I'm gonna quit on. my presentation yeah, sure. and uh, just go back to the regular, regular view, see if I can get my camera back on and participate in conversation in the chat. Sure. So, so let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to get the spotlights in order. So Jennifer was wondering um, if there's a processor in New Jersey yet that you know of. I do not know of a processor in New Jersey. Um, a lot of our stuff seemed to be going west, Pennsylvania and further west. Is that a processor for grain or for CBD? CBD. Okay. There, there's a couple of people that are contract buying and processing. Um, but only for, for their individual products. So, uh, oops, sorry. Um, that I, I do know of one or two that have processing capabilities, but they're only doing it for contract sales. Sure, so yeah. uh, acquiring seed, I'm looking at the chat now. Um, uh, there are all of the sources you probably already stumbled across. Um, 
I don't even want to tout one over the other uh, or, or throw names. I'm not confident in hardly any of them. So many people claiming genetics have sprouted up over the last two years that it's really questionable. Um, we grew Suver Hayes. We last year, I'm sorry, two years ago, two, 2019, we grew about eight or nine different varieties. Um, many of them tested hot. Many of them were unmarketable. Many of them didn't grow well. Suver Hayes did the best from a CBD productivity standpoint. Um, and we bought enough seed in 2019 that that's what we used again because the market was just, it was sketchy. I mean, the, the amount of people selling for one, two, five, seven dollars a seed for feminized seed, um, similar if not higher volumes for established clones. As much regulation as there is, there isn't a lot of regulation on what your genetics actually are because how do you know what variety you're actually getting? Um, it's, it's, it's a really kind of a painful market to be in. You've got to be connected within circles of trust with the, with people that, you know, that know people it's, it's, it's kind of a hairy marketplace. Yeah. A lot of the breeding is just coming online now. Um, varietal purity is an issue. Um, in fact, when you're talking about super haze, New Jersey's evaluating it, whether they're going to allow it again next year, because uh, it was so hot in a couple of uh, the fields here. It is painful, and I be able may be able to speak a little bit more freely than than um, the extension guys, but it's 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 problematic to me as a grower that there's so much regulation on our hemp crop, and yet we're also starting to to decriminalize, legalize the other side of the marijuana crop, and and it almost seems pointless. I mean, we should be able to grow this species or not um but it, it there, there's a lot there's a lot of regulation that you have to be aware of to stay legal a lot and there's even a movement in a few states right now to ban smokable smokable buds that market in several states has disappeared already um so you really got to pay attention to what's going on you know in terms of the regulations yeah, and um, Steve was also wondering um, if you could share the volume of buds you harvested and also the number of plants that you planted. So maybe if there's a ratio for the two that you could share. Uh, I saw in those graphs that that uh, were presented earlier, that was pretty consistent with what we saw. So dried, dried weight per plant, probably a little over a pound. Um, but you've got to go through a lot to get there. Um, and then that's total weight. I don't know. I don't know if we actually got marketable weight a pound per plant. I mean, not, not for, not for quality. So the, the, the testing, um, the state mandated is THC. You got to meet THC standards. Um, but your marketing outlets are, they're going to ask you for everything. They want, they want as much CBD as possible. Um, and in some cases, they're asking for mold testing. Um, and that starts to get expensive. It starts to get really expensive, especially when you haven't sold it because you've got, you know, X, Y, and Z potential buyers on the line and each one of them wants a different test. And you're looking at, you know, a hundred bucks here, 200 bucks there for a test. And then they don't want to buy it. And you're just out over and over again. Yeah. And Scott, another thing that we've noticed is the, um, some of the contracts are really wanting you to push your CBD concentration. And from what we're seeing, at least anecdotally in our first year, is we need to get it at that right time before the THC spikes start to occur. So if, if we get contracts that are saying we want 9 10% CBD or we're not going to buy it, it's going to make it really difficult and it's going to make choosing the right cultivars even more important. Yeah, there were definitely price premiums for higher CBD levels, but you're you're because they don't want to push more throughput through the machinery um, to get the CBD extraction. Um, but you know, if you test hot like you guys experienced, the whole thing goes up in smoke quite literally, uh, and it's not a good day. Um, I see a question in the chat about hermaphrodite plants. You will absolutely see hermaphrodite plants. Um, you have to scout for it if you can. 
depending on your scale. I mean, you get above a half an acre, you're not scouting every plant. Even on six foot centers, you're, you're going to get a hermaphrodite. You're going to get some seeds in there. There are still wild hemp growing where you've never seen them um, that are potentially putting pollen on the breeze. Um, and as this thing spreads and, and continues to grow, um, you could have a neighbor couple of miles away that's growing for grain who wants all the pollen in the world to make seed um, who completely contaminates your CBD crop. Yeah, we had, we had hermaphrodites in our, in our field. The feminized seeds, uh, the feminized seeds, the, 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 basically the way they stress the plants to, to produce feminized seed um, when these really heavily forced crosses uh, stress on the plants will will just trigger that hermaphrodism so um it's it's a gamble you get you get more female plants but you might get hermaphrodites and a lot of people have claimed better efficacy from just growing a, a straight run um and running through and and eliminating males um w with your your greatest degree of of capability you have less less stress less it's easier to identify a male in a non-stressed, non-feminized seed than it is to catch hermaphrodism in a, in a feminized seed. So Jen also asked, uh, can't you take those feminized and cloned seeds that way? You can clone and the more stress you put on it, the more likely you are to get hermaphrodites. Cloning has been the way that, that clandestine uh, cannabis has been grown for years um, and as no clandestine grower will tell you because they won't talk to you. Um, that's what. Yeah, causes not that you have any experience with that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, also a question earlier. I want to make sure we don't miss that. Um, have any of the presenters felt there may be, uh, there may have been uh, genetic instabilities in their seed lots? So other than what we're discussing now, is there anything else that you think um, would be worth sharing as well? I mean, I've had informal discussions with breeders and they think that's one of the biggest problems that they have is the stability of some of the genetic lines. Um, don't forget, as they pointed out to me, a lot of this work went on underground, <laughs> you know, where we're trying to cross from varieties that uh, are probably known for higher THC so that we can get that CBD in there. And um, it's going to take a little while to settle out, I think, with breeding until we get there. Yeah, I don't think we saw any in our research plots per se, but Anecdotally, we certainly do hear of concerns with one person's cultivar and the next person growing the same exact cultivar looking dramatically different. Um, so I think that's certainly a concern. And one of the things that the breeders like is they actually like what they call mutants so that they can get some of these traits in there and they don't even have a pool of the mutants to be able to pull into their breeding program to try to swap traits and things like that. So the, uh, um, some of the complaints that I've heard of is about just the availability of genetics right now that, that they would trust. Right, yeah, the genetics are hugely variable. Uh, it's a, it's a very large genome in the hemp plant. Um, similar to, to we humans. I mean, you, you cross, you get an, an on a lot of unknown elements that are in there and, and what expresses under the stresses of your cultivation practices. Um, there's a lot of variability. Um, I see Mike's question. Um, you know, I would love to see the development of an allowance for hemp biomass for cover cropping and soil carbon building because the potential there is, in my opinion, is massive. Um, the problems that I see are the regulations. So just having the plant um, germinate from seed becomes a matter of regulation. You've got to be a licensed grower. Um, you know, if you want to add uh, that, that $300, $400 license fee to your annual budget, just so you can grow cover crops a couple of times a year and, and, and you know, maybe never, never have to worry about testing or marketing or any of the other aspects, maybe it's worth it. Maybe, maybe it, you know, for the cost of nitrogen or the cost of, of weed removal, uh, maybe $400 a year for, for cover crops that that's dense, um, that lignus, that potentially nutrient cycling for your farm, maybe it's worth it. Um, 
and maybe we could get Bill and Steve to do some different sorts of research at uh, Rutgers for us on that. Yeah, some of the growers I've talked to, they've used sun hemp, sun hemp as the alternative to it, um, you know, for that. Um, it's probably going to take some movement towards getting the regulations adapted to that scenario. I think they could play good poker. Like you asked them and they just. <laughs> yeah, I, I would see the cost associated with it as being something we had to get over first. Um, we have to have a lot more uh, grain and grain production happening before we have the seed at the cost that it would make sense. But you're right. It's a, it's a tremendous biomass producer. And I, it, it would certainly be interesting to, to try to incorporate that into a cover crop strategy. Yeah. Planted in a field stand. When you look at those pictures of uh, fiber production fields, there's not a weed in there because this thing comes just jamming out of the ground and puts up a, a huge solar collecting array of leaves that just really is going to smother out whatever's underneath it. Um, from the grain perspective, I, I bought some grain from a PA grower just to try and run through my mills to, to de-hull, to clean, to turn into flour. Um, I, I had a hard time because it is very oily. Um, it tended to cause problems running through the mills as I had them set up. Um, the, the eliminating the hulls off the seed was somewhat problematic for some of the customers that I spoke to kind of in a, in a peripheral way, you know, I was just trying to explore it. Um, it's, it's got its challenges The the CBD market seems to be the biggest, the smokable flower is very attractive, but if you don't have direct marketing channels or very good relationships, be very wary of how much you grow. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get a lot. I mean, a pound, a pound of smokable flour or smoke or dry, dried hemp flour is a lot of material to try and move. And you're looking at a field of it. Yeah, Scott, from looking at your field too, one point I wanted to bring up is you talked about the sclerotinia with the white mold. You've got to be careful though. Sclerotinia can stay viable for up to seven years in the, in a field. So even if you're growing say soybeans or something, which also can get white mold, if you rotate into that field, you can end up having some problems. It's a nasty one. Uh, it can affect your tomatoes. It can affect your garlic. It can affect a, a number of things. So if you're a vegetable grower, it, it can be sitting in your fields waiting um, for that opportune wet spot for that opportune environmental condition. I, I see uh, Jennifer has a question about what, whoops, where to go. Would it be easier to market the oil than the flower or the buds? Um, and that's kind of a loaded question in a lot of ways. It's uh, depending on what product you're trying to market, um, the marketing strategy that you use. Um, and the oil requires processing um, even beyond just uh, harvesting and storing the flour. So it adds a bunch of cost to it um, as well. So it really depends on what product you're trying to ultimately sell or if you're just trying to, to sell it as like a commodity type crop. And, and you also have to remember too, you gotta be careful the term oil because there's hemp seed oil, which is just like crushing like for soybean oil. And then we have the CBD oil. And I have seen some marketing where they'll, they'll list it as just hemp oil. And people kind of think that that's CBD oil. The two are not the same. Yeah, the CBD extraction is um, either like really highly volatile organic compounds that are used to extract it, like hexane, which is really gnarly, um, or um, highly compressed carbon dioxide, which acts as a solvent and leaves very little residue, but that's hugely mechanically intensive. Um, hu it's a really large investment in infrastructure. Um, and then there's a, there, there's, there's a more simplistic extractions of kind of, um, as you would with like botanicals, you can run them through like a still, a boil still and get um, some of the oils that way. Uh, and I do know some folks like Barefoot Botanicals over in, in Bucks County who are doing it that way. Um, you tend to get stuff that has a green color, right? So you, you can do any number of cottage industry style extractions, um, depending on your marketing. Um, but again, it, it's, it depends on how you're going to market it. So if something that looks like hemp and smells like hemp in terms of color and smell is okay, 
and you can market that, then great. But if you want, you know, a CBD hemp cream, that's like super for your muscles and an athletic product. And it smells like peppermint. Like that is a deeply extracted product um, that takes a lot of infrastructure to attain. Just looking at the chat here to see if there's anything else that I've missed. Yeah, we, um, uh, Adrian's asking about autoflower. We actually had some planned and it fell through because um, the way the growing season started for us at Rutgers, we were a little bit behind. So we did not look at any. Adrian, if you can find a, a ruderalis, an autoflower that's not day length sensitive, there is a lot of chatter around that there are high CBD ver variants being developed um, because that takes a lot of stress off of the one and done growing that we have now. Um, right now, everybody in the Northern hemisphere is on the same clock. We're all planting at about the same window. We're all growing at about the same window. We're all harvesting at about the same window within three, four weeks of one another from, you know, the mid latitudes, mid Atlantic, all the way North to, to Canada. So uh, something that's not day sensitive, if you can find it, you know, good on you because you could grow it like a vegetable. You could grow small beds, lots of small successions. Um, great opportunity for for um, farm scale product productivity for sure. So I'm just wondering if um, you know, COVID willing, we shouldn't convene a group of people together to have a little late summer conference at the end of the season. So Steve and Bill, something to think about. It might be an opportunity to actually get everyone together at, um, at, at your farm or, I mean, you know, something to think about. Yeah, we, we certainly would have uh, done some field days and things of that nature if uh, COVID wasn't here. There, there's also some talk, and uh, Bill and I have both been approached by some folks who are interested in starting a hemp uh, industry association in New Jersey. Um, so you may want to keep your eye out for that as well. Um, uh, okay. There's uh, several uh, commodity groups that are starting to pop up related to uh, hemp production. Um, so that might be another avenue for you to, to meet with like-minded folks that are, that are trying to uh, grow the crop. Uh, yeah, but we certainly that... would be interested. Uh, I'm speaking for Bill now, but I, yeah. we'd certainly be interested in uh, doing field days at the end of the year. Yeah, I think it would be a good way to think about managing the marketing of this nascent industry, it, you know, to think about some industry group. That's a good idea. So um, I guess, you know, Amanda has been running this chat, but I think uh, given that it's almost the top of the hour, we should probably call it unless people have a burning question that they can't, they would just be so upset if they hung up the phone and they didn't get it answered. So anybody with that, you can unmute and just have at it. Uh, while, while we're waiting for that, um, Ag M Brem, um, you know, yeah, you're right. Potential sequestration of carbon back into the soil. You're absolutely right. That's the potential is there, but you better be ready to deal with, um, I, I don't know, I kind of glanced over it, but the stalks on these plants grown for flower are two inches in diameter and exceptionally woody. So you better have some equipment that's got some, some horsepower behind it to chip that into something that you could till back into the soil. Um, again, if we can find, make, uh, allowances for this to be grown as a non non crop as a cover crop um, it's got huge potential for that because you can catch it like you would with sun hemp or Sudan grass or, or many other cover crops where you could cut it low multiple times during the season keep it vegetative keep cycling nutrients back down into the soil as a green manure um, definitely potential there that's difficult to explore under the current, current regulatory restrictions. I appreciate that, Scott. My, my reason for asking was, 
I'm not very familiar with the regulations yet. And was just wondering if, you know, you were required to remove the entire plant from the field or anything like that. Uh, because of the costs, I, I don't know yet. I, did, I haven't explored it because the, the, the earning potential to go all the way to flower and sell is high enough to keep us kind of aimed that direction. Um, and the costs associated with growing the crop in general and coming short um, of its full sales potential are just too high to, to explore those cover crop potentials at this moment. Yeah, one of the other issues that we've faced that came up too is when you get that regulatory sample, you have a two-week window to harvest. And if you exceed that, then it implies another test. Uh, so we're hoping with these new changes with the 30 days, that will help a little bit. But there's not a lot of flexibility in these regulations as they're written right now. Even us at Rutgers, for research purposes, we had we wanted to try to let the, cop, the crop go a little bit after it exceeded THC so we could get some data long-term. And that was very difficult for us to do. And then we had to transport it to campus for analysis. Um, it brought up a whole host of issues there. You know, you're technically at that point, you're transporting a hot crop, which is actually technically marijuana. Um, so there's a lot of issues that have to be resolved for um, dealing with it. All right. I think we should thank you three gentlemen for giving up your Friday evening. Your families are probably banging at the door. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much everyone for dialing in and for our speakers for sharing their knowledge and um, have a wonderful Friday evening and a great weekend, a great long weekend. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.